All right, we're at 400 Beach Seafood and Tap House. It's downtown St. Pete. Come on, let's go. My parents, they met in culinary school. Everything in my household was all about food. We're eating dinner one day, talking about what's for lunch, what's for dinner, coming up in the next week, you know, what we're going to be doing. Anything that I could do to help out in the kitchens was always either playing sick to go help my mom in the kitchen at, at uh, whatever restaurant she was at at that time. Um, and then just fell in love with the, the creation of something and taking taking vegetables and produce and uh, different meats and fabrications into different ideas. My favorite childhood foods was uh, making pot stickers. So we'd make a filling, we'd fill all the wonton wrappers, steamed, steamed wontons and pot stickers. Uh, but like going out, I have a huge passion for sushi and you know the quality of fish and like I just go out and platters and platters of nigiri, and I'm a very happy person. You know, I've always said, you know, we can teach people how to cook, but teaching people to, to want to learn something is a, it's a whole different story. Definitely switch gears into the preparation aspects of things. Um, one of my big fascinations of, of sushi and, and eating it is the simplicity, um, but the complexity in that and how fish is cut, how it's treated, you know, before it hits the plate. Um, you know, it's not just buying a good piece of fish and putting it on rice. There's a lot of little details that go into things. Uh, so I have a huge appreciation to that and the culture behind it. Um, but as far as the food that, you know, I personally would like to prepare and like to enjoy making. Um, definitely like you know fusing things together and breaking boundaries of uh, something supposed to be one way. Um, my question is why and how can we change that? Um, and then a lot of a lot of passion behind making pasta is uh, is definitely that little underlying staple that I'll always turn back to. This segment of Walking Talk is brought to you by Don Pablo, coffee growers and roasters. They call me Don Pablo, and 20 years ago, I discovered my passion for great quality coffee. Today, we're roasting excellent quality coffee that's rich, smooth, and very complex. It's a taste that's new in the world. This segment of Walking Talk is brought to you by Fresh Fish fast. Hey, my name is Ingi Sigurdsson. I'm here at 400 Beach Seafood and Tap in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, and we're gonna start uh, making one of our uh, signature cocktails on menu called Sunkist. So we'll start off with an ounce of vodka. Next we'll do uh, three quarters ounce of grenadine. Three quarter ounce of lemon. The secret ingredient here is gonna be a dash of absinthe. So it's not really enough where you're really gonna notice it as much as it just adds complexity and depth to the back of the uh, cocktail. Get with a little bit of ice. Shake it up.
This one gets uh, served up in a coupe glass. We'll top it off with a little bit of French sparkling wine here. Everyone loves bubbles. And lastly for aroma, which ties in with that house-made grenadine and that absinthe, uh, a little bit of grapefruit. Espressed over top, dropped right in, and that's the Sunkist. All right, next we're gonna do our uh, house smoked old fashioned. Um, this one we do a little twist on it, make it a little more fun. So this is actually gonna be a double, so it serves two people or one if you're trying really hard. So we're using uh, Four Roses small batch bourbon. We'll put a little bit of Demerara syrup in here. About half an ounce. And then Angostura bitters. We'll do four strong dashes there. So just your classic old fashioned build. Hit with a little bit of ice and we'll stir this up. All right, and then while that's getting diluted, I'm actually gonna smoke our decanter here. So we have some applewood chips in here. Get this nice and smoked. We're gonna do a little something fun with the uh, orange peel. So we're gonna use a little crafting scissors. This is optional, of course, but it does add a nice little touch. And ends up giving you like a nice little design. So we'll spritz that over top, get the aromas, oils going. Stack these up. And now we're ready to add our cocktail. So this is how it walks to the table. And again, meant for two, meant to be a little fun. And we'll just pour it table side. And that's how we do our smoked old fashioned. He's a badass. That was excellent. We are with the chef, Alex Pizer. Um, chef, thanks for being part of Truly our a pleasure. world famous rapid fire segment. Yes. Chef, what attracts you to the kitchen today? Um, today, opportunity to create. Um, whether it's, like I said, breaking boundaries, trying something new. Um, innovative techniques or taking old school techniques and either modernizing them or finding another means of, of accomplishing that same goal. Um, and in doing so, you know, creating something that's either unexpected or I shouldn't, shouldn't happen to begin with and create something, a new experience for our guests, um, but still provides that sense of comfort. Would you say that uh, a rewarding part of what you do is mentoring a younger chef or an aspiring chef, I should say. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big believer in, in growth. <clears throat> so I, at least for my personal goal, if I'm training someone or I have a sous chef that I'm working with, my goal is to make you better at what I do. So that way it's progression within the industry. It's personal growth for, for that individual. Um, and you know, sustaining the the opportunities that we all do in this culinary field now uh, would be lost if if we don't continue to grow and develop others. It's gotta teach them. Absolutely. You have to do it. It's a must. And no secrets. Share recipes, share techniques. Um, you know, there's no taking anything to the grave. You know, the food story. is... Share food. it all. Absolutely. You know, so that kind of, it's a good segue. Um, Everyone thinks chefs, oh, awesome food. They must eat like kings and queens at home. 
As it turns out, not so much, not so often. Chef, what are your current eating habits? Um, they're getting off, better. Off work, at home, on the way home, <laughs> over a garbage can. Uh, they're what getting better. The, the over the garbage can definitely is, you know, a kitchen eating habit of, you know, grab what's in front of you at that point in time, quick snack. Um, and then, yeah, the late night snacks on the way home. I'm, as I said, I'm getting better, but I'm at Wawa probably four or five times a week, you know, guilty pleasure, Wawa cheesesteak. Wawa, huh? Uh, it's just bad enough that it's fantastic. Tony Ann, my cousin, <laughs> this, this segment is for you. She's a Wawa freak, like a freak with the Wawa. If I'm feeling healthy, I'll go chicken salad. But it's quick, easy, I know it's consistent, and I don't have to clean anything. Based on, uh, based on your family, uh, again, everyone's, you know, kind of from, cut from the, the kitchen cloth. Uh, when did you realize you wanted to be a chef yourself? I'd say early parts of high school. Um, I had a lot of aspirations uh, within athletics. Played baseball in my life, wrestled, played golf, um, and had a big, I, I went through a lot of injuries, so I had a big appreciation towards like the medical field and orthopedics and sports medicine. So I was studying a lot of kinesiology and different aspects of anatomy, thinking I'd go into orthopedic surgeon or some aspects of that route. Um, but the more I did it and the more I kind of looked at what it is that I, I found happiness in, I, I regretted or I was not looking forward to all of that, but I loved every bit about making a pizza at home or uh, torching a marshmallow and hollowing it out and making a little one bite some more thing that I did when I was, I don't know how long ago, but. Well, count me in for that. <laughs> it, uh, just little things like that, it, it all kind of clicked to where I was like, this is something that I definitely have an interest in and apparently I'm pretty good at it. So went, went forward and just continued down that route. How old were you when you started in the kitchen? Uh, when I first started in the industry, I was 17. Started off as a bar back working for hospitality company, staffing company. So I did a lot of uh, high-end events and uh, private functions bartended all around DC and different Smithsonian's and uh, inaugural balls. Um, so a lot of a lot of really cool events. And so you sharpened your teeth uh, from different components in the of, of the industry. If right. there's a job in a restaurant or the industry, I've done it. So what is then your opinion of front of house, front of the house? Um, an integral part in the guest experience, and that's that. It's what it all comes down to. It's every chef that has a passion for the food has a passion for, you know, providing that food to others. We're not all just cooking for ourselves. So in order to cook the great food and write the fantastic menu and for that guest to enjoy that food, the front of house has to be just as knowledgeable, be able to learn uh, and be able to approach the kitchen um, with any questions. Every question from a server is coming from a guest and our job to provide a proper guest experience, I mean, they're an integral role in that. So the, the restaurant doesn't succeed without, without servers. Chef Alex, I appreciate you spending some time as so the audience can kind of get into your head a little bit and, and see where you're at. It's time for walk-in confessions. I know you got a great story, so let's go do that. I appreciate you, thank you. Absolutely. This segment of Walking Talk is brought to you by Farm Fresh Produce. It's walking confessions. Come on. All right, chef. Walking confessions. Horror stories of the business. We all know what it means. What do you got? Um, I mean, cuts, burns, bruises uh, are an everyday thing. Uh, but definitely one of the most memorable and one of the worst that I've seen would probably be. Um, so it was right before Thursday, Friday night service. So call it 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, open at five. Um, one of our cooks, we're already shorthanded that night uh, for a whole other reason. But one of our cooks going through his prep and one of his prepped items was to slice uh, a full slab of bacon on our meat slicer to cut down to lardons. This isn't gonna be good right away, so go ahead. So meat slicers, traditionally you have it like super, super thin to slice prosciutto or, you know, different aspects to like to get the super thin slices. But when we want to do bacon for lardons, we opened it up. So it's got a decent width to it. Um, and 
without too many details, he definitely lost the, a good chunk of the tip of his finger um, on the meat slicer. Um, he did have the courtesy of then turning the machine off and moving the bacon, so we did save a good chunk of bacon, likely. Um, we did find the tip. <laughs> God. We found the it's tip. It's terrible. It's terrible. Um, it's a horrible story. But luckily enough, you know, in a kitchen we have containers, we have ice. Yes. Uh, so the tip of his finger was packed on ice, uh, was handed to him, and he was driven to the hospital. Uh, they were able to reattach the tip of his finger. So, Chef, all right, like, uh, an audience, more importantly, audience, right? So, uh, we say it all the time, this business is dangerous. You've never worked in this in this industry, you've not been in a kitchen, the back, but it's hor horrible things happen, so you get a pretty plate and a full belly, right? The best part about the whole thing, though, was he came back to work the next day. That, that guy's surgery, not bad surgery, sutures, big covering over his whole hand. But he said, Jeff, I can hold a knife in my left hand and I can take things in and out. So he came in, he helped out where he could and night went on. There is intestinal fortitude in the job, right? <laughs> Long story short, if you see, uh, you see the chef, give him a hats off, a thumbs up, um, uh, bartender, servers, you know, hit him with that gratuity. At the end of the day, be nice. Realize that it's hard. There's a lot of things happening in the background in these business, in the business, in these restaurants. Um, thank God for you know uh, no cross contamination yeah. and all that no, other stuff. Everything clean, sanitized, wiped down. Correct. Absolutely, and that's what happens on every instance. Um, very, chef, very much so. Thank you. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. Be good out there. This segment of Walking Talk is brought to you by. Peninsula Food Service. Alex, chef. <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, I almost wanted to give like 10 minutes of just speechless and staring at this food. Not going to do it. But this is really beautiful. So we've been in this restaurant for, a, a, you know, good four or five hours today. And um, we got to see everybody in action. Before we get into this, I just want everyone to know that this is legit. Their bar program, legit. Their food, their culinary is on another level. You might hear me say this on a regular basis. I don't go to bad places. I already know where I'm going is solid, always. This is next level culinary. Chef, what do we have? So starting over here on your left, you have got a snapper crudo. So local Florida, um, caught snapper. Uh, you have a tomato, cucumber, and jalapeno uh, water down on the bottom with an Aleppo oil. Uh, on top of each piece of snapper, you have a avocado, cilantro, and lime puree. So that's gonna give you a little burst of, of, of freshness with a Fresno curl and some citrus lace and marigold. This is so refreshing. Nice, light, delicious way to start off your meal. Flavorful, but leaves room for more. Awesome, wonderful. So over here we have a heirloom tomato salad. Uh, so you have heirloom tomatoes macerated in minus eight vinegar and uh, extra virgin olive oil, some light aromatics. Uh, all of this is sitting on top of a honey and thyme whipped ricotta. Um, a little sweetness, a little herbaceousness, uh, some fresh cucumber, toasted almonds, and some pickled mustard seed. That's gonna give you a little texture, a little, uh, little pops of acidity uh, throughout the dish as you eat. Um, you know, I told you that I was food. allergic to... Uh... <laughs> that you did. It's like, cheers. Just a little bit of honey. <laughs> yeah, but that's right on, man. Nice, creamy, silky smooth. Hey, um, for all my paisans out there, you know, take your uh, ricotta and mix that. What, what's the, what kind of ratio would somebody actually do with that? So this, this is uh, freshly made ricotta. Mm -hmm. So this is milk and a ratio of cream brought up to about 190 eight degrees right under that 200 degree mark before it's curdled with lemon juice. And that whole time it's steeped with fresh thyme. And then when it's whipped after it drains, uh, a little bit of honey, local honey, uh, whipped into it. So those of you uh, home chefs, uh, make sure you rewind that part a bunch. <laughs> you gotta, it's really awesome. You gotta try that. Uh, our sea bass and fennel. Um, so 
taking one ingredient and using it in a multitude of ways with different styles and techniques can lead to different flavors. So you have our sea bass, just pan seared, roasted in the oven. And then down on the bottom, you have a fennel cream, uh, brown butter roasted fennel, a raw fennel salad dressed with uh, fennel pollen and the fronds of the fennel, and a fennel oil kind of dispersed throughout the cream as well. So if you didn't catch that, you have the sea bass, and then every other component in that dish is some form of the fennel. Of fennel. From, from bulb all the way up to the fronds, the entire entirety of the vegetable is utilized. So this is a no waste dish here. And all of the scraps from cutting the roasted fennel is what's used to make the fennel cream. So entirely every piece of that vegetable is utilized with zero waste. So instead of getting like a, you know, sea bass risotto, this is like such a great alternative. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> And then our, uh, our centerpiece here, we have a whole pan seared bronzino. So the entire bronzino served, you have the center bone and the, the bones inside um, taken out and uh, flayed open. This lets you enjoy wow. the entirety of the fish, the nice crispy skin uh, without having to worry about who's gonna take the bones out or that underlying piece of soggy fish underneath uh, when it's typically just laid flat. And this is just simply prepared with salt and a little lemon juice um, and letting the, the quality of the fish shine through. I really just want to take my mic off and throw it away. <laughs> I just want to, I really just want to eat all of this. Um, and it, you were saying this is a progression or an evolution. Yeah, absolutely. So when we first started here with 400 Beach, we wanted to see, you know, what can we do? Like, how can we adapt to the market um, as we, you know, come in and you know, I'm not from the area. Um, I grew up in New England. I've lived out in Texas. I was in Orlando for a number of years. So every region, every city, every every neighborhood has its own has its own twist on things. So we wanted to definitely see where we could fit in and adapt and and start to push some boundaries um, and bring in some new techniques and uh, just vibrancy of flavors to the area. I sincerely mean it when I tell you that you guys are doing the right work. You're doing Thank the you. right work. Um, gang, we're in St. Pete. This is where you wanna be. Get here, find a way, make it happen. Where did you leave your accent, by the way? So you're, you know, you're, <laughs> where's that at? What, what state did you leave? I your, uh, moved around enough that it's all a little mismatch of everything. Yeah, yo, I was expecting, <laughs> you know, that's what I was expecting, but no, not at all. Chef, thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate you having us out. We've been here for a long time. It's getting busy up at the front. We'll get out of your hair. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Cheers.